now for your listening pleasure, here's Polizzi and Rose, covering the week of media, marketing, and digital content news. This old marketing. Take it away, boys. Hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose. And welcome to episode number 313 of This Old Marketing for March 3rd, 2022. And with me, as always, my friend, my colleague, a guy who's back from vacation and is definitely disappointed that baseball's opening day is canceled, Mr. Joe Polizzi. How are you? Welcome home. Well, thank you so much. As I told you, I would have spent way more weeks in the Bahamas and <laughs> well, and yes, wouldn't we all? Weather. Yes, it was. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, actually, I, I saw some comments on our Web three special episode. It seemed to I people dug it. Do I, th- well. I think people mostly dug it. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't do the news anymore. Maybe we should just comment on weird stuff that we think is somewhat interesting. Which I guess we did. That is the show. That's Anyways. kind of what we do. Yeah, it's, it's, we it couch it around real the news. <laughs> we couch it around real news, but yeah. really, it's just a platform for us to get our crazy thoughts. To the to our wonderful audience, how have you? Yeah, Pretty what was much. your two weeks like? Was it was uh, it like crazy? Well, you were like pining to talk over a microphone. Was it? You know, did you miss it? I, you know, I did. Um, first of all, I mean, other than the obvious, which we'll talk about here in a moment, um, which is the, of course, you know, sort of like eclipsing all other news. Yes, exactly. um, you know, uh, um, but generally speaking, yeah, I did miss it, and um, you know, it was. Uh, but the week was good. The you know the week and a half was was good that you were you were gone. You know I got a lot of work done. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Much more productive when I'm not bothering you, right? For the entire um, week. Yeah, you know, and <clears throat> some new things developing. You know that we'll talk about here in a couple of weeks that I've been promising for some time now, and finally getting ready to sort of evolve. Well, I'm uh, very yeah, I'm very excited about. But the stuff, yeah, that you know a little bit on. about yes. it, right? I'm yeah, very, so. very look, much looking forward to it. But just back on to your baseball point, yes, they, I, as you know, I grew up a baseball fan. It was always, I know, I was yes. thinking about you when I saw that hap- hit the news. It's always been the, you know, my number one sport until right. very recently, which I've really become more of a football first. It's really, it's, it's swapped, and this was the year that. For the first time since 1914, I believe that the Cleveland baseball franchise has a new name, moving from That's the Cleveland right. Indians, the guard to the Cleveland Guardians. But yet, there's nothing to guard because there's no game <laughs> being played. This is a problem for baseball because it's already losing popularity with with mostly kids. Yeah. So, I mean, football and base uh, basketball and soccer and gaming, esports. They're taking over. I don't. Th- I don't think baseball can afford to get into these money battles no. and squabbles. Right. And I think it's well, slowing kill them. slowing down. At, you know, slowing down an already slow sport is not. You know, I mean, here here's the thing. the The thing you got to love about baseball is the marathon that it is. Right. You know the 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 length of the season as well as the number of games played and the i mean it was always going to be something that you know you never can spend you know the thing with football is it's 17 games and you know 3 months basically and, and one game kinda, every game you know, is important one game right, is important that's right. one game in baseball won't kill you doesn't matter yeah. right so it's always going to be the kind of thing where you know like I've I've said this before to you is is, is that you know I follow baseball kind of like I follow some TV shows right I I read about it in the newspaper and I follow you know my team is the Dodgers here that I've you know the, you know I grew up in Texas and had Texas teams of course but you know I I became a Dodgers fan quote unquote but I don't watch the games right I I you know I follow the box scores yep. and I you know and then it gets to playoffs time and if they're there ah, I'll watch right but. You know, this kind of thing, slowing things down and canceling games, that doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the owners. It doesn't help the players. It doesn't help the game. It doesn't help the television. You know, it doesn't help anybody. Well, if you look at, I mean, baseball, the big problem is you have so much of, so little of that time is actually gameplay time, right? It's like, oh, I'll throw a pitch. That just took a second. And now right. I got to wait 20 seconds, maybe longer, 
for another pitch. It's 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 so it's so drawn out. It's very difficult. Look at the way that soccer has increased in popularity. They go straight forty five minutes. They do halftime and go another forty five minutes. It's great. Yeah. I mean, right. that's the way that it should be. Football is, for the most part, they're playing. And with that clock moving the way it is, you've got lots of moving parts, lots of things happening. It's gaming, esports, same way. You've always got something going on. If you watch anybody stream, if you watch a esports, kind of like if you're watching uh, Valorant and two teams play each other, there's a lot going on. They take like a <laughs> two-minute break, too in, much like a minute yeah, break in between, and then they go and go and go. So, And then you have baseball, where... You know, it it was it's probably best if you're going with friends to the game and you have discussions about other things. Sure, <laughs> yeah, that's where you go. Right, you go sit for three hours yeah. and you have a nice chat and you eat a hot dog and you drink a couple of beers and oh yes, there's also a game. And going it's a beautiful on. evening. Yeah, it's great to be outside. It, you know, maybe we'll catch a foul ball. Whatever, I mean, whatever. It's all good. But yeah, it's tough. It, even, both my kids growing up were very tough for them to sit through a game. Yeah. Unless we just bought them barrages of chicken tenders and french fries, which no. is what we did. <laughs> and it worked incredibly well, by the way. Right. So, and yeah, That's all so, I really need. That's all I really need. I mean, you know. You, uh, yeah, so I mean. Give I, me some chicken tenders and some french fries, and I'm, <laughs> exactly, I'm kind of good. That's all anyone yeah. needs. No, have, by the way, have you seen McDonald's new uh, perfect bundle? Value meal, you got to check <laughs> no, this I out. I have not seen this. It's this. Oh my god! It's <laughs> so last. So last night, it's late. My wife and I are hungry, and our go-to spot is Taco Bell. Always Taco Bell. It's like, but okay. for some reason, right. we both said I really could go for a Big Mac because sometimes you got to have a Big Mac. So we roll through, and we're gonna each get like a Big Mac combo or whatever. Well, I saw the most beautiful thing in the world. It was this perfect bundle package. <laughs> and I stopped and I said, no, 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 we're not going to uh, order what we were going to order. We're going to order this perfect bundle. Two Big Macs, four fries, two cheeseburgers, and 10-piece chicken tenders for 17 wait, bucks. Wait, wait, say that again? Two Big Macs. Uh, yeah. Four small fries. Yeah. Two cheeseburgers. So it's a family. It's, and you're a supposed t- to yes, feed a family well, of five No, it's on not that. for a family. It's the perfect bundle, which it could be just for me, <laughs> which it ended oh up being. God. But that's not. Oh, no. <laughs> no. No. I didn't eat it all at once, but I'm just saying uh, that is a great deal. Like, just add up the component. If you had to buy all that separately, it would be $3,700. Oh, my God. But if all together in the perfect bundle, which it came in in a miraculous little p- package as well. Uh, compostable package, <laughs> I want to say. Uh, uh, environmentally yeah. friendly here. I'm sure. A miraculous package is, is, is what I heard you say. $16.99 so. and 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 for all that, and it was glorious. It was because I just had it for lunch, too. I had I had a Big Mac last night, and then I had the half the chicken, tent, chicken nuggets okay. and, and the cheeseburger behalf, for lunch. On behalf of the entire This Old Marketing audience, that's nasty. That's just nasty. <laughs> That's just nasty. by nasty you mean incredibly amazing? Like <laughs> what are you talking about? It was great. I don't oh, know why man. I just thought of I, that. my 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 stomach hurts just even thinking about that. Oh, I, I'm not on any diet at this point, as you can tell. I clearly, but <laughs> that's clearly the well, case. Well, but you know, if you're on a diet, all you do is you get the Big Mac and you take out the middle piece of bread. That's that's really a diet. That's. <laughs> That's really cutting the calories out. Oh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any, anyways, so. Uh, well, hey, before we get to the show, can I can I talk a little bit about uh, Creator you, yeah, Economy? Yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah, you got a deadline coming yeah. up here, a big deadline. So today we're recording this. It's Thursday, 3-3, three, three, which is really weird with the threes. 3-3, 3-13, three, 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 yeah. Episode 313 on 3-3. Three, three. So there's something yeah. something amazing is Something amazing is about to happen in this show. That's correct. <laughs> so uh, yeah. tomorrow, Friday, 3-4, is early bird deadline for Creator Economy Expo. And I want all of our This Old Marketing listeners to attend, if you're at all involved, in creating content, which I know most of you are. This is really bent to business owners and content creators who want to become content entrepreneurs. Uh, obviously, you are involved in this 
Robert. I'm so thankful for that. You'll be moderating a couple sessions. Uh, we've got an incredible lineup of speakers. I don't know. If, did you take a um, have a chance to look at all the speakers we have? I have. Well, I you know, and and honestly, one of the things that I'm so excited about is the fact that you know they're they're all you know it's all new to me. Right. These are these are new, wonderfully talented content creators that you've got. It's like, you know, there's a lot of events that give lip service to this stuff and then bring in the usual suspects of speakers. And you did not go this Thank way. You. You've yeah. gone the experts, the, the people who are actually doing it. So it's cool. We, we, we tried. Yeah, we tried very. Aside very... from that Wally Koval. Oh, my I God. Wally. So guy. see, people don't realize Wally Koval, who's founder of Accidentally Wes Anderson, he worked with us at Content Marketing Institute. And Wally right. is one of the right. one of our favorite people on the planet. And years ago. He's a punk. He's a, he's a punk. Well, he's a little bit. He's yeah, a... but he, I mean, <laughs> you know, how, how can you go? He's a millennial yeah. that just, I like yeah, that kind of millennial. He's a lovely man. Uh, I love him to death. So it was so great because you and I, he, he had dinner with you and I in New York talking about this concept. Yeah, that exactly. became AWA accidentally. Wes Anderson, and if you're not familiar with, so Wally's going to be a keynote talking about his story. They've got well over a million followers uh, on Instagram. Best New York Times best-selling book. Amazing content operations that he's got going on there. So that yeah, you're right. Everyone that's speaking is a content creator. Like Alicia Ether. I don't know if you know Alicia. She goes by Leash Capiche on TikTok and Twitch. Like, I wouldn't be aware of her unless we did an interview with her for um, The Tilt, for the newsletter. And I'm like, oh, my God, she's amazing. You know, she's got millions of followers all over the place uh, in the gaming space. So I was like, oh, let's get her to speak. And then we've got, you know, Dan Pink, of course, is going to close us out. And Roberto yeah. Blake is yeah. going to open us yeah. up. One of the most incredible YouTubers on the planet. Um, so it <laughs> and then 30 others, including you yeah. and me. Yeah. So yeah, we're really <laughs> knuckleheads like us. Yeah. So anyways, long story short, May 2nd, 3rd, 4th. May 2nd is opening reception. 3rd, all keynotes. Uh, and we're going to have a great reception that night. Lots of wonderful networking. 4th, breakout sessions around audience building, revenue generation, content operations. And then, of course, we're going to dip our toe into Web3 business models because we must, as we tend to do on this show as well. Again, tomorrow at the end of the day is early bird deadline close. So go to cex.events and register. Get your best possible price. And I'll get. I'll tell you what, I want this old marketing listeners to come more than anyone else because we've had this long, wonderful relationship. So if you're interested in coming, you want to go to Phoenix. It's at the Arizona Grand Resort. We're limiting this to just 500 people. If you use the coupon code POLITZI, if you don't know how to spell my last name, P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I. <laughs> and then with that code and the early bird lead line by tomorrow, it'll take you down to a $495 rate. So you can wow. get all that for $495. Every a hotel room there is a suite. Uh, we have people, we have families that are coming, you know, they're taking their significant others and their kids. There's a water park there. They're spending five, seven days there. And th for a lot of people, this is their first trip since, you know, before COVID-19. Yeah. So, and we're finally seeing, and by the way, we chose Arizona because we could have a lot of this outside, have the doors open to make sure people feel comfortable, all that stuff. So please go to cex.events. Uh, I'll be there. Robert will be there. We definitely want to see you in person. I love these types of events because it reminds me back to when we launched um, Content Marketing World, Robert, and we had just 600 people. And it was like a family, and we, you know, and we got a chance to talk with everybody. And I'm looking forward to this kind of event again, where you can really build some relationships and get to know people and have good conversations and build a network of, of supporting people that can help you with your, you know, content business and uh, moving forward. So anyways, cx.events, uh, check it out. Would love to see you there. If you have any questions, obviously let me know, but we'll, it should be great. It should, we're yeah, getting a lot of sponsor support, great. which is wonderful. So it seems to be all working out because who knew at the beginning who of this knew? thing? So, yeah. Well, you did, but. Well, <laughs> I did not expect, if you had asked me six months ago, as I told people on the show, I did not expect to launch another event. But right. <laughs> yeah. I right. I can't yeah. even say anything because my wife just shakes her head and she just thinks <laughs> right. I'm the biggest idiot yeah. in the world because I can't stop launching things. She's like, what yeah. is wrong with you? Can't you just retire like normal people? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I can't. Yeah. So it's cruises and, and launching events. That's Cru cruising that's and what launching I'm events. About. That's, yeah, I'm, yeah, there you go. I'll go on a cruise that's... anytime. 
and I have to launch stuff. So, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, you sent me a list of 17 articles that we, we got have a to lot talk to talk about, about. there's yeah there's a lot of news to, there is a lot of news to talk about um we are going to spend just a skosh of time here uh, recognizing more than anything else and acknowledging the <clears throat> giant um you know elephant in the room that has sort of well, quite literally invaded uh, all of us, um, which is uh, the the Russian and Ukraine uh, situation. And we'll talk a little bit about that because it does actually have some relevance to our audience and certainly to um, certainly to the world and and uh, and what's going on in in the world of content and marketing and and crypto and all sorts of things. Um, but we'll also move and, and quickly talk about uh, the NFTs in the metaverse. Um, I know that's a huge shock to most of you, <laughs> but a couple of acquisitions uh, in the last week and launches um, specifically by Salesforce um, might just start to make things real here. And so we should talk about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about native advertising and how new ad works from retailers, uh, or I should say ad networks from retailers are coming together to reach younger people. And then we'll talk about TikTok, of course, and how it might better be described these days as TED Talk. Uh, I totally oh, stole nice. that line from Tom Webster. See that? Yeah, see I did? Nice. I, but Tom Webster I didn't see did that. that. Coming, that's a Tom, you got that's it. That's a Tom Webster yeah. joke. Yeah, that's a Tom Webster joke. And then if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about uh, LeBron and his moving his barbershop show uh, a little bit. Um, why? Because, well, it's LeBron and we got to talk about LeBron. Um, I'm going to rant about who should get credit on advertising campaigns uh, and then rave a little bit about white guys on podcasts. Um which will That's be so, an interesting thing. So um, and Joe, you're uh, you're going to talk about a conversation you had with Michael Stelz. Yes, um, absolutely. And, and um, some of the interesting things going on in the world of Web three and those kinds of things. So yes. let's get to it. Let's because we got a lot to get to. And there's going to be a ton of links in the show notes, folks. So just so just so you know, there's going to be lots and lots of links there if you're interested in finding these things. Um, we'll skip around quite a bit, I'm sure. Uh, but we'll start with just acknowledging, of course, that, um, well, uh, in case there's um, there's no chance at all that you've missed this in the news because it's been everywhere. But, of course, uh, Russia has uh, commenced its invasion. And as literally as we record, this is still uh, in the throes of, of really awful fighting uh, in the streets and in the towns of Ukraine. Um, and, you know... We're hearing about it as well. So much to our very great blessing, we have friends and fans um, of this show in the area um, who have been tweeting to us, who have been sending us emails, who have been sending us direct messages on LinkedIn um, about things going on there, um, about things that are that are really happening versus what being, being said is about happening. And there's a couple of things for us to explore, Joe, which is <clears throat> one – is the misinformation. Yes. Um, there was a Twitter uh, post by the CEO of Yandex, the second largest search engine in Russia, and talking about misinformation, um, what's going on there uh, about um, the way that Russian media is positioning their invasion of Ukraine. Um, and maybe, um, according to an Axios article that we'll, we'll link to, um, maybe this is the tipping point for propaganda and disinformation because we're actually now starting to see some of the, certainly here in the West, the U.S. Um, media outlets start to put the hammer down a little bit on some of this stuff. Um, and then, you know, we've gotten some things around the idea of, there's a tweet um, that uh, you sent me actually about uh, 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 one of our friends and family in in, uh, in the Ukraine, um, or in Ukraine, let me forgive me for that, um, uh, talking about crypto and how credit cards in the Ukraine don't really work any longer. So now... Um, basically, they've they've switched over to crypto as a main currency. Anyway, lots to sort of comment on there. I don't know where you want to start. Well, but I what think, do you think just with, with what you left out. Well, I thought that that tweet basically was, was saying, "Hey, I can't do anything with banks anymore in yeah. Ukraine, and so what do I do? You know, there's no ATMs aren't open. I've got no right. cash." And basically said, I'm keeping myself and my family alive through Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it's very similar to what happened in, I believe it was 2013 in Cyprus, when 
the banks turned in Cyprus and said, uh, you know, they basically were in major debt. They were working on a deal with the EU and they went to the banks and they said, okay, well, banks, I'm sorry, but 50% of all of your, the money that you have from your customers needs to go to us. We need your money. So basically, if you had a savings account in Cyprus at the time, they would just take your money. So this is a little bit different, but what it shows you is, and and by the way, this is happening not just because of Russia, Ukraine. This is happening because of now all the sanctions, all the banks doing what they're doing based on the government regulations. And I guess the- Sure. It's starting to have, the Russian side is starting to do it as well. They've actually threatened to go all crypto, all in on crypto. It's Well, it's interesting because, okay, again, it's not perfect. Uh, It is, in a lot of cases, you might think that it's risky, but the thing with crypto is it's non-sovereign- and theoretically can't be manipulated. Whereas every other currency that's run by a sovereign entity in the world can be, if not is, manipulated. And we're seeing it happen right in front of our eyes. So in that case, what do you do? So it's just interesting that it's happening right now in Ukraine where, okay. So that's where you and I have talked about, we don't know the future of Web3. We don't know the future of the token. Where is this going to go? Where are the business models? What we're seeing firsthand, here's a use case for where it comes in handy to be off the grid, if you will, and not within the current centralized financial system. So Right. But in bo- on both sides, right? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Which is really interesting. Absolutely. It's a, you know, it's a fascinating thing to me to watch because, you know, you're, you're seeing, you know, the theory seems to be that oligarchs could do this just as easily as, you know, some of the, the sort of more consumer focused people in Ukraine are doing it. And that you could see a rise in crypto value, um, you know, in the short term, certainly as as more sort of currencies get dumped into there. Um, now, interestingly, I think what you also saw was a lot, you know, so where, you know, one of the things that is fascinating is one that Switzerland actually said, yeah, no, we're not neutral this time. <laughs> this is this is this is not gonna yeah. go on in our watch. We're we're actually shutting this these bank accounts down. And then also to see Russia get kicked off the SWIFT system. SWIFT which system is yep. it, you know, which is incredibly powerful <clears throat> for everything from e commerce to, you know, just moving money back and forth between that's, banks. That's huge. And then of course that just this just happened. I just saw it on the news where Germany took uh, one of the Russian uh, billionaires' boats, yachts, just confiscated it. I mean, it's yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing how this is affecting the. You know, if you're a billionaire, there's a lot of billionaires in Russia. Can you imagine? A what lot, you're, a lot. I mean, they're taking their boats down to. You know, they're getting as far away as they can because nothing is sacred. Um. So it's, yeah, it, this is. I've, and you know I haven't what? seen anything. I haven't seen anything like this financially happen in my time because it's always when you when you think about war as terrible as it is, you, you sometimes you forget that it's the financial sanctions that sometimes hit the hardest. Sure. Well, th- and especially these days, right? Where <clears throat> because of technology, money moves so freely. And the interesting. Th- here, so here's some. Here's this is a genuine question I have. I don't. I really don't understand this, which is, you know, you think about what's going on right now, and the next step, of course, and we'll see if it actually happens or not, is for the banks themselves, where all these billionaires have their money, um, which, you know, are in, you know, U.S. banks, Swiss banks, yeah. you know, you know, Hong Kong banks, you know, all, all, all over the place, I'm sure, as they start trying to move money around because of sanctions and they start moving money between, you know, it's not that you can't track that. That's easy enough to find out. And, you know, you have somebody like HSBC or, you know, or, you know, a, 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 you know, wherever the bank go, nope, we're not we're not giving you access to that. Now, all of a sudden, you know, th- this, you know, as has been spelled out in many of the articles I've read on this, that's like, you know, that's sort of the. You know, if if billionaires can't access their their money in any way, right? Move it via Swift, but also can't even access it in their own accounts. Then that would cause real pressure. Here's the thing: from both the tactical invasion side, which I am not an expert in, I have zero expertise in there. So just to be very very clear, 
And then on the money side, on the business side, I, I just have to imagine that before he went in, before he made this decision, Putin had to have accounted for that, right? I mean, the, didn't he? I mean, did, did he, are, are we really in a place where this, is a, this would be a surprise to him? on both how difficult it is to actually occupy a country the size of Ukraine and, and, or actually, you know, so it's like, I have to make the assumption that he's smarter than the average chicken, right? So yeah. that he accounted for this and that, which makes me even more scared to say, if he accounted for all this, what's the end game? Yes, exactly. Right. That's the, my, that's you know, my he, concern as well, because he would have had to account for this, unless you would have thought, right? Unless I mean, again, I am not an expert at all. Please don't take this right. as anything. But I, unless he thought that maybe China would, would take his side. But China's, I think, smart enough to say, "Look, we're not going to hurt our financial relationships with the rest of the world in the United States, and they're not going to do that." There's no way. So you've got Russia all by yourself, and of course, the ruble just collapsed. So the right. money is is almost worthless there now. I and then and then to your point, Putin, the Russia has their reserves outside of Russia. They can't access them. Right. And you can't get any services outside anyways to buy anything. So Right. I I don't that I you could have should have seen it coming. I'm sure they've got smart people looking at this. I don't get the whole thing. I don't get I, I it just yeah, that's what that's what just baffles me about this whole thing because I mean, somebody. This was a post that I saw on, um, uh, I think it was Reddit or something, um, that actually posed this. It, it, it's so far out there that you go, huh? It, it actually, it's so far out there it makes you think. Which was, the the post was basically the end game here is you go, you invade Ukraine, you fail purposely fail to get it. You pull everybody back after much death and destruction and awfulness. You pull it back. What happens is Ukraine then says, gets confidence and says, yay, we're awesome. We, we beat back the, the, the Russian horde and then say, we're so awesome. In fact, we don't need to be part of NATO. So they don't join NATO. And then basically Russia gets what it wants, which is Ukraine not joining NATO. And you go back to, you know, sort of, and I, and I looked at that and I went, that's some like 69D chess, you know what I mean? But it, it, it seems so far out there to be unrealistic to me. I just, I haven't heard anybody give me a rational view of what a smart person would be thinking about what's the end game for Russia yeah. here. Because they're clearly not going to occupy Ukraine for years and years like you know we occupied iraq or you know anything like that. i mean that's just clearly not going to happen so what you know where did, where does it go i guess is yeah, the point. I, I don't know i the only thing that i can the only thing that it made me think of is when and you and i talked about this on the show but when president trump would say something crazy or do something crazy it always ended up being a distraction technique for something that's right. else like not a yes. not a stupid person had had an idea of what was going on. I'm going to make this crazy move over here because I'm moving. I'm moving my pawn, or I'm moving my knight in a different direction. Right. And well, here's so the, basically that? here's a hundred crazy things. One of which I want to come true. Right. I. In other words, you just pour so much crazy shit on the table yeah. that basically everybody's distracted by everything, and so that one crazy thing that you actually want to happen, that you make happen, everybody goes, "Oh yeah, that's just part of his crazy stuff," yeah. right? If you just poured the one thing out, everybody would have freaked out and you know and and gone nuts. But but because you've poured, you've in, you've filled the entire table full of crazy stuff, it, it's 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 you know it, it, it's hard to know what to pick. But you know, so the the two things that coming out of this for for this show would be one is yeah. there's there's a financial issue that we're seeing play out in front of us, and then yeah. the other one that you brought up, which is really important, is this disinformation or no information yeah. getting that's out right. on certain channels. And again, that's why it plays to I think smaller content creators and influencers, because if you have state run media or biased media run by certain entities that can't or won't show. Th and by the way, I'm not just talking about Russia. I'm talking about everywhere oh, right, around exactly. the world. As yeah, we know, yeah. if you look yeah. in, there are people showing things and not showing things. 
that they should or shouldn't be. And it's crazy what's going on. And that's where a lot of the trust comes into who's on the ground, who's the who's that person that I trust that's going to give me the right information. And it's so funny how that level of trust has continued to move away from traditional media outlets to smaller players. Yeah. And I think that's going yeah, to be the case for a long time. I, I just can't see because there's so there's so many different um different levers you're pulling and pushing on in traditional media and you've got so many so much politics behind it. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, but it is amazing to see how much of this is actually happening. I mean, I you know, I mean, I don't it the other thing that has baffled me is that how anyone could come down on the other side of this, right? You know, where but I've actually seen in my Facebook feed from, you know, people that I'm relatively acquainted with from the days gone by who have said stuff like, you know, Ukraine must be hiding something, right? That Russia would have never, you know, Putin would have never invaded them if they, if they weren't hiding something. So, you know, we need to wait till everything comes out before we make a judgment on this. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not the way any of this works. So it's, yeah. I'll tell you it's, what, it's, it's, there, a, there's a, I don't know the name of it. I'll have to find it. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes, but there is an amazing documentary. Of course, I love documentaries. It's on Netflix. Maybe you remember the name of it. It was on the dope, the Russian doping scandal when they the, when they had the Winter Olympics. What was it like, ten or twelve years ago, something like yeah. that? The elaborate things that they did and went through so that they could swap out blood samples was incredible. They go through the whole process and they show the secret doors and how you know they'd yeah. make the switch and whatever. You know, it's called Icarus. <laughs> Icarus, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did you see it by chance? Yeah. No, I didn't. Oh. I didn't. I didn't see yeah, it. Yeah. It's 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 fascinating so that you understand what certain people I mean, this is what you know somebody like Putin does. So yeah. it doesn't it doesn't surprise me. So well, for all of you out there that are in and or near the area, know that we're thinking Absolutely. about you, know that we're we're feeling for you and and um, you know, there's 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 I don't know that there's much we can do. I mean you know, there are some things we can do about, you know, certainly spreading the word, but, but, you know, but, uh, we are, we are thinking about you very, very much. I'm not going to say the stupid hearts and prayers thing. That's just dumb, but, but, you know, but we're, but we're very much sending, you know, sending you all the love that we have and, and, and thinking about you very much. And, so and, yeah, th um, this is over as quickly as possible. As, absolutely. All right. Moving on now to our next story, which is actually a little more akin to what we normally talk about here, which is about NFTs, the metaverse. And it's really starting to actually, interestingly, take some shape here. So two stories that we'll cover <clears throat> in the show notes, one from TechCrunch um, that just fascinated me. Um, which is Epic Games. So you know the big gaming sure. company, Epic Games. They make Fortnite. They make a, a number of things. Um, just bought an entire band camp, and it's not even Friday, says the headline. Uh, happy band camp Wednesday, says Fortnite maker Epic Games. They're treating themselves to an entire band camp. The music download site Bandcamp announced the acquisition in a blog post today, adding that it will continue to function as a standalone entity with co-founder CEO Ethan Diamond at its helm. We share a vision of building the most open, artist-friendly ecosystem in the world, and together we'll be able to create even more opportunities for artists to be compensated fairly for their work, Diamond wrote in the post. The relatively business-as-usual uh, approach includes the continued operation of Bandcamp's marketplace, the community, the editorial product, the daily as a standalone entity. So they are a media company, after all. Um, and that's the interesting thing here, um, which is... So the article actually goes on and says basically that it's a strange, odd, weird acquisition. And I actually... Yeah, think, I want to hear your take. Um, Go ahead. A totally perfect acquisition. We're going to pair this, by the way. I'm going to come back and talk about my, my feelings on the Bandcap acquisition. But we are going to pair this with another story that uh, comes to us courtesy of martech.org, uh, which talks about the idea that Salesforce, the B2B company, of course, giant B2B company, who just had a crushing quarter, by the way, just absolutely crushed it, um, basically announced that they are going to launch an NFT cloud service um, for marketers. 
Um, and there's been some interesting sort of pushback there from the employees about NFTs and environmental issues and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But back to the Bandcamp thing. Um, the reason that this is so cool is, so remember Fortnite. So Fortnite, two or three years ago, was you downloaded it and you went and you played it because you could shoot your friend in the face, right? But now Fortnite is at, Fortnite is actually more of a concert venue than anything else. I mean, artists like Ariana Grande, um, a whole bunch of artists have done virtual concerts in Fortnite. Um, very successfully, by the way. So this to me is such a perfect acquisition for Epic Games to start to bring music from lower, you know, sort of lower unknown and uh, as yet unpopular necessarily artists into a true metaverse, which is their Fortnite sort of world, open world, and start making different ways of listening and accessing and buying music available through the Fortnite metaverse. And those two things together make for a very, very interesting new offering from Epic Games, which is now not only getting into the game business, but clearly getting into the music business as well. So a fascinating, that's why I didn't I'm so see, I didn't see that connection there, but I, I can now, you know more about how they're using Fortnite in that way. I, I did not. I did not see that. I, I looked at it more for Epic Games is all about um, looking for the opportunities in the creator economy, and this is obviously one in music. And I I consider them that they will go after more of these types of sites, not just music, but every kind of creation. Yeah. Well, they basically late last year they started this. They have a whole music series. Right, they called it their Soundwave series, um, which is all sorts of uh, shows, really, as the best way to put it, um, featuring artists from around the world, um, and you can experience this these artists in, in the you know within the Fortnite game, like within the you know. So you go to an island. One of the islands is a non-competitive, non-fight island. and you can go watch these performances. Right, so you can do you know you can see Travis Scott. Ariana Grande, um, and but basically, now they're giving this sort of the the this creative mode, if you will, um, to build like little worlds in there where you can actually go have an entire music festival, right? Where you can go so see a bunch of music and you know see the artists and see the you know see the um, hear the music and buy the music within the. Yeah. The whole thing it creates an entire experience, which is 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 coming. Now, if you're if you're epic, what do you need? Well, we need content, right? We need we need the music, you know, because we can go because you know it, this. Think about the the Netflix challenge, right? So Netflix started out by licensing all of this music to say, hey, we're going to license all this music, you know, and or excuse me, license these movies and show the movies. But what did they do? They got into the original music business or the movie business. Here's Epic doing the exact same thing, building an experience where they were licensing music, I'm sure, from the big stars and will continue to do that for some time. But now they can develop original music from unknown artists through Bandcamp and basically feature these this new music in a new way and basically create original programming. It's an yeah, it's an interesting concept. I again, I think you're going to see they have a I'm pretty sure they have a lot more cash that they can spend. Oh god. To, they've, yeah, they're yeah, Yes. They are. I think you're going to see see much more of that happen. I I think the sales force <laughs> the the Mashable Salesforce uh, t- title here it says even Salesforce's own employees think its NFT plans are dumb. I thought that was yeah. a great headline. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you agree with that? Do you? Uh, what do you think about the Salesforce thing? I think they announced it too early. I think I th- I th- I think this is a this is a press trying release that got out news. ahead of itself. Yes. Exactly. They're, they're trying to trying to catch a little bit of news jacking here, especially coming on the heels of their amazing earnings uh re- report uh, you know i think they just they got out ahead of themselves here and and because of course this is an area they should be exploring of course it's an area right that they should be looking at and building and thinking about building products for 
Um, and I think they just, the, 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 you know, the effort to publicize it and market it got out ahead of itself. So yeah, I mean, it's not terribly difficult for them to do. I mean, they have the infrastructure to do it. They could, they could literally go out and buy somebody tomorrow. And that's probably what's going to happen here is that we're going to see that Salesforce buy somebody. Um, and you know, by the way, they could, I, I, I'm not sure of the financials here, but you know, could Salesforce swallow up OpenSea? Probably. Yeah, probably. Yes, that, I, that's, um, a, that's, that's a good possibility. But to your point, why go out and say that there's a report of NFT of Salesforce's NFT service coming? I'm like, why even do that? You're right. They right. were just trying to jump on this Web3 optimism, which in a lot of cases is not optimism right now. There's a lot of suspect. and Well, that's the thing, right? It's like, you know, why, you know, it, it's that whole, what's that classic? I think it's an Abraham Lincoln attributed quote that basically says, or Mark Twain. I forget. It's like, you know, you can shut up and let the world think you're a fool or you can open your mouth and prove it. Um, and this is kind of the this is kind of that. Right. Which is there's no there was no reason for them to make this announcement public unless they have it. Now, they didn't really do it publicly. This was clearly an, a, a, a this was a, a an open call to employees like this wasn't a huge press release out to the public or anything. This was a call to that got leaked, of course. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but then, you know without really thinking it through about what the push pushback is. I mean, this is the classic thing I talk to clients about all the time, which is you have to, you have to think about the implications of the whole story, right? In other words, when you think about the point of view or the story that you're going to put out into the world, you have to think about what, what are the implications? What are you going to, you know, what, what is going to be your message for those who push back on the story? And you have to think it through and they just clearly didn't. Well, if you look at the the internal letter that went out, which was employ, um, imploring uh, Salesforce executives not to do this NFT thing, came right. from, it says, the internal letter, which over 400 employees have signed, says the amounts of scams and fraud in the NFT space is overwhelming. We implore you to reconsider. Now, great. we I, I agree. You and I are on the same page with them not coming out with, we might do something. And then, of course, it wasn't formal, but don't say anything unless you're actually ready to launch exactly. something. But that said, the the exact thing in this letter that employees have signed, the amount of scams and fraud in the NFT space is overwhelming. That's a reason why Salesforce should be involved. Exactly. Because they can bring credibility right. to it. What's happened over the past two years with crypto? You've had every major financial institution in the world get involved in crypto now, which has legitimized it. That's why you saw That's 72 right. Super Bowl commercials around it. Because everyone sees it as, oh, it's okay now. Everybody's in, all the big players are involved. Everybody's trying to get their money now, right? So it was, oh, it's okay. Well, in the NFT space, it's not there yet. This is still Wild Wild yes. West, if you want to call it that. And so somebody like a Salesforce coming in, and I guess a lot of, I don't know what an NFT service, cloud service means. Like nobody knows what that is. But I, I think if you <laughs> if you understand what an NFT is, the underlying smart contract, the the digital asset is not on chain. It's too expensive to put it on chain. It's linked off site. So you That's have right. all your smart it's contract hosting. and you, it's, it's web yeah, you get your certificate of yeah. authenticity, right? Here's what I own, here's what I get, all this blah blah blah. That's right. And then there's a link outside to somebody else's uh AWS, if you will. It says, here's your image. Yep. So yes, could that go to a you know NFT AWS service? kind of thing that Salesforce would run? Sure. Does it make sense to have it in the marketing and sales area because brand people in the next five years are going to go crazy with this stuff? Absolutely. Makes perfect sense to do this. They That's just right. didn't have to talk about it yet. So I like the That's idea. Right. Salesforce, Salesforce exactly should absolutely right. do it. And, 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 and you're, it's such a great point that you just made because when and if the messaging comes out, the messaging could and should be, arguably, depending on timing, and of course, this is just all you know, uh, hypothesis at this point. The message is the message. Just to your point, could have been the world needs a trusted provider right. of this, scam free right? NFT. And, exactly, you know, and just as they lived up to their sort of disruptive trust that they created in software as a service in two thousand. 
they could create a level of brand trust in NFTs in the cloud in 2022. And, but it's just, yeah, it's just the message got ahead of itself. Yeah, well. it, the, it, that's what it, they, exactly. They, and OpenSea, by the way, as, as the largest marketplace for this thing, I mean, it is under a lot of scrutiny right now. They're growing so fast. There are bugs. As with any growing company, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. People losing, you know, big bucks. Well, I mean, they, bucks, it gets out yeah. in the news, and you figure out, okay, what happened? Was it a phishing thing? Was it an open sea right. thing? There's a yeah. lawsuit going on. All kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. So, so that's where I think the employee letter is funny, saying we don't want you to consider because there's so much opportunity in this space. That's exactly what they're saying. Like what? Yeah. Well, thank God you employees aren't taking over our global strategy. Because wherever there's <laughs> chaos is opportunity. So whatever. Oh, that's exactly right. <laughs> so yes, of course. We're going to stick with the horse and buggy. I think that'll work just fine. So let's yeah. not innovate. Yeah. Much more to come on this, for sure, on both sides. So just very, very interesting on, on both sides of this, of this coin, as it were. See what I did oh, there nice. on this coin? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right, let's cover one more story before we get to rants and raves here, which we're going to skip one and go right to the TikTok stuff because it's uh, fascinating. Um, so if you didn't see the news, folks, uh, TikTok for not everybody, not yet everybody, but uh, for some people has now bumped up the video length uh, to 10 minutes. Um, this coming courtesy of the Morning Brew uh, that put out the article and basically says that TikTokers uh, have become very popular for hyper short pieces like 30 seconds, 90 seconds. And now they will uh, be able to do things that are 10 minutes long in the animated GIF meme that they put as the hover header years. Tom Hanks going, oh my God, we're going to be here till 10 o'clock at night being Yes, now TikTok is going to basically consume our lives. Um, we're going to pair this, by the way, because it's totally related with a breaking really news story, which just happened yesterday, actually, um, this coming courtesy of CNET. Um, TikTok announces uh, it's got TikTok Live, and it will feature now a new hour-long sketch comedy show called Staple View. Uh, the stars of the upcoming weekly show include Gray Fagan and Grace Ryder, who have 7 million followers between them, um, and that TikTok has assembled this cast of TikTokers to star in fully produced sketch comedy show on TikTok Live called Staple View. The show will premiere Thursday, meaning today as we record this, on a dedicated channel on TikTok Live, according to a report from Deadline. The show will be created and executive produced by Sam Gray, who is the executive producer of the war comedy drama Whiskey Tango Frockstrap. Perfect for sketch comedy, I guess. Uh, and comedy brother Nature. Uh, it is uh, described as a modern take on sketch comedy in variety show formats, featuring a collection of popular individual content creators, which is about the most PR <coughs> press releasey thing yep. I've seen in a long time. So, um, what say you about the 10 minutes and about the new sort of expansion of content here to an hour long series on TikTok? When anybody going to watch an hour long series on TikTok? Yes, absolutely. Uh, because TikTok is not just a short form social media platform anymore. TikTok is a fully functional, multidisciplinary media company. Uh, they will get into everything. If you want my prediction on it, they, you know, says TikTok bumps up max video length to 10 minutes. That will be infinity. They will bump it up to whatever. <laughs> it's going to be whatever. Good content can be as long as it needs to be or as short as it needs to be. It doesn't matter. And TikTok is going to, has the platform for this. They have the audience and they will offer that just like YouTube uh, is any length. You could see a 15 second, 10 second thing on YouTube, or you could see a five hour docudrama on YouTube. There's no difference. People will watch it for, yeah. they have their own preferences set up. And TikTok knows its audience probably better than anyone else in the world. And they will figure out how to serve the right content to the right people because they're, and nobody gets their algorithm, but it's amazing. So yeah, that's my take. It is yeah. amazing. The only thing TikTok that, that really I can't figure out yet and what their play is, their creator pay is so much lower than somebody like a YouTube. They, of course, could just bring that up. But but because their findability is so much better than YouTube and their discoverability, they're able to share less of that because creators want to be found more than anything else. So it's interesting that they can get away with that. Because it's they're quite so good. Amazing to me, yeah. It's quite amazing to me. Do you find yourself have so so? I've obviously been 
watching some TikTok here and there and, you know, and sort of killing some time with it and all that kind of thing. The conversation that you end up having with someone else about TikTok, and and it's fascinating to me that inevitably your conversation turns to, ah, what's in your TikTok feed, right? And it tells you about the person's personality. I I was just listening to uh, the Pivot podcast where Kara Swisher and and Scott Galloway were having this exact conversation where they're like, she was like, well, what's in your TikTok? And he's like, well, I get dog videos uh, and then I get uh, people talking about, as he put it, people talking about social justice who aren't wearing a bra. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's God, like, it's and, and Kara then started to tease him a little bit about his, you know, his taste in content. And she said, ah, I get like home improvement videos and uh, also, uh, you know, um, sort of, you know, videos about uh, LGBTQ issues. And, and like my TikTok right now anyway, seems to be all about the sort of, you know, stopping people in the middle of the street with the, you know, the, the cops, you know, and they're sort of, you know, asserting their rights to not give them their ID. For whatever reason, I get tons of that. And of course, dog videos. It just, the, the, the algorithm is so good in terms of keeping you engaged that you, it, it really starts to tell you a little bit about your personality as you start using it. It's like, it's, it's a fascinating thing. It's the it's the one service that I I haven't opened yet. I'm not on TikTok. You should be scared. You really should be because it's a, it's a time suck. It will. Well, what's interesting? So I'll, will I'll tell you, you what's happened. So so I'm friends. All my friends are we're all golfers. I have this group and we have this texting group. So we're all sending texts to each other. We go on a golf trip with each other. Whatever. We're generally between the ages of 45 and 55. And yeah. When this group started 10 years ago and there's texting, you know, of course, it, it started out links to articles and then it started out, then it went to like Facebook videos and YouTube videos. And now every one, so there's a random tweet here and there, but almost everyone's a TikTok video that I'm getting now. It's just interesting yep, to course. see that. Oh, it's yeah. No, no, it's, it's a, it's absolutely a shift. But like people, but, but, the, but Gen Z is not getting upset because you know, everyone else has taken over TikTok too. It's different because you each get your own personal feed, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. You get your, you get your, your feed, right? What you see is for you. It's just, it's a fascinating thing. Like my wife's is completely different. Like her TikTok, like she tells me about all these TikTok videos that she's seeing and, I'm, and she's like, have you seen this one? I'm like, no, I don't even know what that is. She's like, wow, that seems like it's really popular. And I'm like, no, it's popular for you. It's, it's not popular for and it's just, it's a very genius thing. It's, it's amazing what they've been able to do. Yeah. So anyways, yes, I I, I think yeah. that TikTok is doing all, they're doing all the right things and they're taking advantage of the popularity that they have right now. And nobody seems to care that it's a Chinese company in the United States. And nobody seems to care that they don't pay creators much of anything right now. So prediction, prediction in the next six months, we start talking about that more. Oh, we start talking pay about the Chinese. data, the access, the privacy and, and yeah, and TikTok and the Chinese thing, it's going to come up. It's definitely going to come up. Well, whether it'll do something or not, I don't know. No, I don't know either, but we're going to, we will talk about it. That's my prediction. Well, I don't know. It seems like we've passed the point of no return with privacy. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, I don't know about that. I th- I think that stuff's coming. I think we would be talking a lot more about it. But we already for have the, for for you. We Ukraine already right have now. a GPS we, device yeah. on us at all times that any company can locate where we are. They have that. Yeah, data. but the fact that it 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 but it made I don't know if you saw the State of the Union speech. It made the State of the Union speech. Targeted data and targeted advertising to kids made the State I of know, the Union but speech. That's when been, it makes the State of the Union speech, it's going to be a it's thing. Been an, it's been talked about for a long time, but nothing... I know. I know. Okay. I know. And maybe I'm just being Pollyanna about it, but but I do believe well, it's going to be Well, you're Polly or Anna. I don't like know if you're both, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on, yeah. folks, to our rants and rave section so that we stay a little bit on time here uh, and talk about something in the news or something that makes us a little bit into a rant or a little bit into a rave to make us feel like, oh, baseball's starting or baseball's dying or something along that effect. Do you want me to go first? No, I'll go, I'll go, go first because I'd love, I want, okay. I want to hear your, your take on this. I just wanted to give a shout out. We've talked about Mike Stelzner's podcast, Crypto Business. I was able to.
able to yeah. be a guest on it. It uh, the episode released this week. We'll put it in the show notes. It's called Beyond. So it's Crypto Business Podcast, and the title of this episode is Beyond Art: Using NFTs for Access. So basically, we talked about you know my my thinking around non fungible tokens and the benefits and offerings behind them much more than the piece of art and and as, as an overpriced JPEG. So we talk about a couple business models. I'd go through the the V Friends business model. I go through our never ending ticket business model. Why we made certain decisions. What I would do differently when launching these things. So if you're trying to figure out what the long term business model is for this thing, so. I went through it on that podcast, and he's doing a great job with it. So, and seems to be very successful uh, launch with the uh, with that podcast, and he's had a lot of our friends on it al- already. So, th- yeah. so just a little shout yeah, out there. Yes. And I like I've been listening. I like to this. I, I have not listened to your episode yet, but I have been. It's next on my. For my walk, I'm I'm going to listen to it probably today. Well, I like this yeah. episode. I like the way that Michael set it up because there's too many people out there that think about this overpriced JPEG as an NFT. And we initially go through and say, yes, that's a thing. That was phase one of this thing. Where are we going now? And we talked about what are the different applications right now that we see in front of us and what's the future of what this is going right. to be. So, And I think there is a thing. And again, we talked about it. I don't even know if it's going to be called NFTs. It's not. It's going to be something else. We're gonna just going to call it what it yeah. is. But it's going to have that technology backbone. So, yeah. anyways, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, what do you got? You got a whole bunch of stuff. No, I, I have one. I have two little things um, th- there, and I put them together purposely, and it'll make it'll totally make sense when when you hear sort of the full thing. So, my rant, and just heads up, I, I know this is going to be unpopular. Um, uh, this is this is I, I I rarely I think do this, but. I'm pretty sure this was this is going to be an unpopular opinion, but it's a rant nonetheless. Um, so last week, while we were out, uh, while you were out uh, ostensibly, and then it has emerged a little bit again this week. Um, so the CEO of Coinbase took a took a victory lap um, on the Super Bowl yeah. commercial, and of course we talked about the Super Bowl commercial, which was ostensibly just a QR code floating around the screen like a DVD screensaver. Uh, and basically he took a victory lap in a Twitter thread and the Twitter thread in one of the tweets, uh, basically said they were patting themselves on the back about how genius they were and how wonderful they are and how amazing they do things and all of that. And in one of the tweets in the Twitter thread, which was 10 or 12 tweets long, he said, agencies would never do this. Um, and so that created quite a stir, um, because then, uh, Kristen Cavallo, who is the CEO at the Martin Agency, then responded on Twitter, basically saying, but an agency actually did do that, um, calling out the fact that uh, they actually hired Extensure Interactive to do the ad, um, but that it, it, it itself, the idea was uh, an idea that had been pitched to him theoretically by their agency as well. And she even pointed to page numbers in their pitch deck where they actually pitched this kind of idea. In her response, she said, look, I'm not trying to take credit for it because I know good ideas come from different people. Um, and But basically her point was that she was trying to say, you know, agencies should get credit, right? Agencies should get the credit for this. And, and you're disparaging agencies um, and the, all the wonderful work that they do by not admitting that. And then she clarified that because, of course, she got lots of you know, hurrahs from the agency world for, for doing that. Although I would note that Accenture Interactive stayed very quiet about it. Um, the, then she went on her LinkedIn and posted a more lengthy uh, post basically saying why she did it. And, and the post itself got 800 and something comments and went a bit viral. And it's all basically everybody saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for saying this because people need to, to hear this, that agencies need credit and creative ideas need to be credited and blah, blah, blah. So here's my unpopular opinion. I, I, I come down on the opposite side of this, uh, you know, and, and to be, you know, I, I come with a little bit of the experience here. You know, I've been on the agency side and consulting side of marketing, creative, and digital for 30 plus years now. So I've worked in big consulting firms. I've worked for small agencies. I've worked on my own as a consultant. I've worked, you know, in in services and, and product businesses. I know a little bit about this stuff. There is a mantra 
that I grew up with anyway. I don't know if it's the same way anymore, but the mantra that we always grew up with when we were in the agency world is the client always gets the credit. Always. End of story. Done. Right? So the fact that Accenture is like not coming up and going, yeah, we came up with this idea is like tells me something. To me, she's bringing up this, and she has every right to, by the way. She has every right to bring it up and say, hey, by the way, we pitched this to you, and you shouldn't have said that. Um, but it, it reminds me so much of the, the fact that, you know, agents, that, I mean, there's a great scene, by the way, in Mad Men where this exact scenario plays out, right, where Peggy comes into uh, the office and and is and is talking to um, you know the the, the 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 they're having this conversation and she says basically I never get credit and he says that's what the money is for <laughs> and so <laughs> the, right the reason that 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 clients go and pay the money and the reason that it's usually a work for hire and the reason that it, you get the money is because they're the ones who make the decision to actually put their reputation on the line with whatever creative they decide, right? The agency doesn't lose their reputation if the ad goes sideways. So the client always got the credit, it, always, to, to me. Now, having said that, I don't think that Armstrong, who is the CEO of Coinbase, had any, it was ridiculous. To take a victory lap on, on a piece of creative that goes out for a Super Bowl commercial is just redonkulous. Um, you know, you let the work speak yeah, for exactly. itself. Um, and he did use the word we a lot. Um, so his really only stupidity here was saying that the AJ agency would have never done this. It, that just was unnecessary. But, you know, this goes again to this idea of, you know, you can, you know, you can let the world think you're kind of nutty and not say anything, or you can prove it and sort of say it. With this, if I'm Kristen Cavallo, the CEO of Martin Agency, if I'm her marketing person or PR person, I'm going, this gets you nothing other than a bunch of comments from inside baseball people saying you're awesome. Because what clients see in that, what clients see in your post is, ah, you're, I'm going to do something to piss you off and you're going to throw me under the bus, which is not the way you want to position an agency. You never want to talk about the work outside of the, you know, within your, you know, within your own walls, right? The fact that she quoted page numbers of pitch decks and, and actually called them out specifically on it doesn't do anybody any good. It certainly doesn't do them any good from a client perspective. So I don't buy the whole poor ad agencies don't get enough credit for the work that they do. That's what the money is for that. And so the key for me is, yes, Armstrong's an ass for saying agencies wouldn't do this, but just shut up. Nobody asked, right? Nobody asked about this stuff. And I, again, I know that's an unpopular opinion because agencies should get credit. But I would just say, okay, who, who got the credit for the Apple 1984 ad, right? Who, who, you know, who, should, who should get the credit for the 1984 ad? One of the best, most recognized ads of all time. Mm -hmm. Right? Who gets the credit for that? Steve, Steve Jobs, Jobs gets the credit says, yeah. for that. And of course, it was Shia Day, but it wasn't even Shia Day. It was a freelance copywriter and another guy at Shia Day who actually did the actual work, who actually came up with the concept. And then it was actually, uh, you know, Ridley Scott who actually shot the thing. And actually, you know, so who should get the credit there? Is it Ridley Scott? Is it the the copywriters? You know, the, and, and by the way, it was from an original. The original idea was a print ad. So anyway, the, 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 the point is all of this is that it's, you know, that let the work speak for itself and, and just shut up. I, I just don't, I just don't see the, 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 the controversy here. Now I'm going to pair that with my rave really quickly here. I'm just going to mention it. My rave, I don't know if you saw Saturday Night Live, but there was a sketch that they didn't air for time and it was one of these fake commercials. And the fake commercial, it was for the Fisher Price White Guys podcast set. And it's a just brilliant. We'll link it in the show notes, obviously, but you can also just Google it. The, it's this Fisher Price. And it's basically white guys on podcasts who will literally let any dumb thing come out of their mouth. And, and there's a shot of, you know, it's John Mulaney down in his basement with this Fisher Price podcast set. Podcasting I love to no it. One it doesn't record anything. <laughs> it doesn't record anything. It lets you say any, even the N word. You know, it's like, uh. So I'm pairing my rant with this rave because 
any dumb white guy can say anything on a podcast, and I probably just did. So just take it all into consideration that I'm very self-aware about the actual rant this week. Um, and there you go. That's what I got the, to say. The, the, it's a three-minute SNL sketch that, that's worth It's so good. It's so watching. good. There's a lot of scary truth in, in that as well. And yeah, I'm aware of it. Yeah. Exactly what you said. So but yeah, I'm glad you. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know that was. Yeah, I didn't know John Mulaney was back and that he. Uh, oh, he had a whole thing in his intro. His intro I did about, watch the. You know, I did watch the intro. Did, yeah. When he when he talks about his intervention, he's like, when he when I walked in the door and I saw all my friends, including those on Zoom. I knew right away it was an intervention. <laughs> Did he say something? Of course, I gave nobody them gets heck together on, for me. I like gave them that. heck on Zoom because they couldn't be there in person. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Am I not important enough? Is my drug problem That's not right. important enough for you to be here in person? <laughs> exactly. I thought that was pretty funny. So, uh, yeah, very exactly. funny stuff. Very funny stuff. All right, what do you got this week? Uh, yeah, I mean, CEX uh, working, <laughs> closing closing down sponsorship so we've got a couple weeks left in that and we'll be on site in a few weeks checking out you know making sure everything's good and of course another reason to to get into the sunshine and away from cold cleveland weather although it's getting better it was it's supposed to be 60 this week which will probably happen for five minutes and then that will be it so what do you got planned this week uh, this week i am all about cmi university um i have finished my uh, new curriculum nice. for 2022. Yeah, clocking in at a gorgeous 325 slides. Yeah, holy so, oh crap! My gosh, it's it's Are a lot sure of work. Sure, that's the right it's number. Been, it's maybe 275. It's been a lot of work. I actually made it. No, I actually made it 325 for on purpose. It was actually 324, and then I just added like an extra summary slide just so that it would be 325. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's been a it's been a. I'm just gonna say it's been a shit ton of work and. Um, but I'm super proud of it. I'm really, really, really proud of it. So I got to record all the videos. I got to record all the videos this weekend and, and get it ready to rock and roll because it needs to get launched. It's already late. Um, and so, yeah. Wow, that's, that's, that's a lot of work. Weekend. That yeah. is a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good deal. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to get to that and you're going to get to closing some deals here and we're going to sign off until next week. And uh, in the meantime, we uh, like I said, we'll put all the show notes in the in the on the page on our wonderful little website at this old marketing dot site. If you haven't been there, get over there. Uh, leave us a review. Share it with somebody. We're trying to grow this audience. Um, and if hopefully you like what we're doing over here and basically two dumb white guys. <laughs> talking into a Fisher Price podcast set. Just love, I might have to get one. I want to try and get one because they're just so great. Anyway, get on over to our thisoldmarketing.site site. Remember the Twitter questions and comments. Hashtag us up on Twitter. We love that. We love the story ideas. Um, best wishes, warm wishes, love and safety to all of you uh, in Ukraine um, out there. And we're hoping that this ends very quickly. Otherwise, until we meet again next week, remember, everybody, it is your story to tell. Tell it well. We'll see you next week on This Old War.